Hello everyone, and welcome back to Young People in Politics. With the government being established a year ago today, I invited the three presidents of the government party Youth Wings, who all opposed the initially planned programme for government, onto a call to see how they think the government has performed in the last year. Joined with me tonight is Brian Mallon, Uke Duran of Ografina Foyle, Art O'Mahony, President of Young Fine Gael, and Rob O'Donnell, Chairperson of the Young Greens. Right, so we'd start off anyways, uh, I want to welcome all of you here tonight, I appreciate you taking the time out and I understand that there was a bit of uh, rearranging that had to be done and apologies on my behalf for that as well. But now that we're all here, uh, by the time this comes out people will be watching or listening, it will have been a, a full year since the government was formed. Some remember this as a time of celebration, others as a time of dread. Uh, maybe some people just in between not too sure of what to think about it. Um, I know particularly um, from first-hand experience a lot of the uh, parties that were particularly going into government, had a mixed opinion of whether they wanted to go in with certain parties. Now, Rob, we can probably touch on you a little bit. I don't think any either party was too worried about going in with the Greens. Um, I think it was more so a case between Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael not wanting to go in with each other. And I think the Greens, to a certain extent, had a mixed bag as well uh, with regards to going in with either. So let's start there. Um, you know, obviously, the feud of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael goes back for years. Some might say it's unjustified now. Some still stick by their guns on that, whether it's their historical uh, treaty debate or whether it's more recent uh, bits and pieces. Some hold Fianna Fáil very responsible for the collapse uh, prior to Fine Gael going to government. Some blame Fine Gael then for the existential housing crisis. Some blame both. Um, maybe we can come to that as well. But firstly, I want to ask before we jump into that, each of you are obviously the presidents of your respective youth wings. All of you were opposed to it. Firstly, why did you join your youth wings and why did you choose to run for president of your youth wings? And then why were you so vigorously opposed to this to this coalition? I'll start with Art and I'll work my way then to Brian and Rob. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely perfect. And it's a, it's a very big, multifaceted question. Um, I might start with why I ran for president of the organisation. Um, I, I did a term on the YFG National Executive where I held a few different roles. I, I was invested with policy campaigns and national secretary and I, I uh, took a term off where I kind of focused on the international side of the organisation. I, I wanted to come back because I genuinely believe that youth politics, regardless of your, um, your dogma or your ideology, but it really is a vehicle for driving change and achieving policy objectives. But also, I mean, politics isn't just about the serious nitty gritty of the nuances of policy. It's also a fantastic social uh, network. And I guess as somebody who's been involved in youth politics for the bones of six or seven years, I wanted to to take charge of an organization that I love and to, I guess, be involved in the reopening of that post COVID and making sure that we could return to whether it's um, whether it's um, a cafe or the back of a pub or whatever uh, we, we hold our uh, or events that we could return to some class of normality and that we could actually use the position that we have in government or the position that we have in the Oireachtas to achieve something positive. And then on the question as regards why I would have been hesitant to um, return to government, uh, it mightn't just be the, the nature of the coalition. I was largely of a view that the party in the general election last year um, was voted out of office. I think it is important, given the nature of democracy, that that is respected. And I think that um, a period in opposition would have been healthy for Fine Gael. And I also think that co a coalition to keep Sinn Féin out of power, which seemed to my mind at the time to be the modus operandi for the development of the coalition, was counterintuitive and remains counterintuitive, as the opinion polls have shown, because it hasn't necessarily prevented any surge in Sinn Féin support and will quite possibly deliver a Sinn Féin government mixed with the Labour Party or the Social Democrats or whoever else. I don't think that serves our politics well. I don't think it's good that we are seeing a situation where, on the whole, 
centre parties, whether they're centre right or centre left, find themselves at odds with populist parties like we've seen in other countries. Mm-hmm. We'll come back to that point a bit later and I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask you further on that. But Brian, we'll go to you next. A uh, similar question as to what I asked to start. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I joined back in, in 2015. Uh, I think you know I was just looking for something more exciting in life. I guess a lot of my time into to GAA probably overestimated my abilities. Uh, and looking back on that, I think that's, that's true. Um, so I was a bit too committed there and stepped back a bit from that and I had a personal experience um, you know, with a, you know, a, a health issue that kind of made me look at things differently and it gave me a fresh start uh, in life, I thought, to do something positive. And I'd always been kind of hemming and hawing about getting involved in politics. Um, I remember sitting down one day you know, reading the paper and saying, I'm going to learn more about politics, like actually what it means. And I just couldn't get it into my head, actually. So I, I left off for a few months, parked it there. And, um, but, you know, the reason that kind of came about was because I was always into history. Um, I always had a massive interest in that. And I've always been a, an Irish Republican. And, you know, I believe personally that's going to lead me to the Fianna Fáil of all parties. I know other people are going to disagree, but, you know, I respect their opinion. And I hope they respect mine. But, you know, I, I don't really, I don't have any family connections to the, to the party or anything like that. But for me growing up, I suppose, born in 1993, you know, I was too young to remember the, you know, the rainbow government. And, you know, ever since I can remember, it was always Fianna Fáil in government. And, you know, coming from my background, um, you know, very working class, you know, no one from my family has gone to university until my, myself, uh, you know, parents working low wage jobs. But the reason why they could own a house, I thought, was because of Fianna Fáil. The reason why I could actually aspire to go to a third level university was because of Fianna Fáil. That's my, that was my belief. And then there came a point where I wanted to get involved in politics and it was always going to be Fianna Fáil. So in 2015, I marched up to the stall at the Front Square in Trinity College and the rest was history. Um, I was welcomed there and I became like, I landed a position as PRO the next week in the Wolf Town coming. A great crack there. I've always been interested in social media and having a laugh on it. And, you know, I thought that went pretty well. Managed to ruffle a few feathers and get our name out there. And it was a wonderful experience. And then just kept involved in the party in the background. And to run for president, I suppose, people just pushed me to run for Leinster organiser of OGRA um, coming up to November 2015 or 2019 when we had our national youth conference. And luckily, I was on a post uh, because I may well have been beaten. But, you know, when I get involved in something, you know, I believe I've a proven track record of trying to make it better. And it, it actually working. Hopefully I can say that after my term as president now, we'll see. <laughs> It's a lot more challenging, but I certainly did that as an answer organizer. And, you know, like like Art said, once you're on your national executive or the central officer board in our case, and you can see the work you've done and you can see where improvements can be made. And there weren't too many improvements that could be made, to be honest with you. Uh, Tom Cahill was my predecessor. I, I don't know if you've met him, but quite an exceptional individual and it was quite an exceptional, exceptional central officer board. And, you know, we, Fianna Fáil Grassroots has been, you know, our strength ever since the, the foundation of the party. And in terms of OGRA, the grassroots network had withered away and under Tom's stewardship and along with myself and the rest of the organisers and the rest of the COB, we managed to repair those structures. And now we have over 50 units across all 32 counties. Uh, you know, I think that that's a, a monumental amount of work. And I think you need to be ambitious to build on top of that. And that's what I wanted to do. We're in government now. Um, I'll get to my, my opinion on the, the coalition anyway. But, you know, I believe once you're in there, you have to be positive. And I wanted to bring that positive voice to it, even though I was against the coalition in the first place. And a lot of people were crying out for that because I think, you know, obviously the start of this coalition, it wasn't going well. Um, and, you know, that's fair enough. But it doesn't mean you have to give out all the time. If you want to affect positive change, you have to get your hands there. You have to get in there. Uh, and start actually affecting that change yourself. Grab the bull by the horns. And, and that's what I wanted to do. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do now. Trying to protect the most vulnerable. Trying to protect people from my background. Um, you know, trying to ensure that this country prospers. Everyone has a right to education, housing and the likes of that. You know, we're in government now. We have to take the chance while it's there. The government might not last four years. We just don't know what's going to happen. And we have to act quick. So that's why I wanted to get in. Um, but then in terms of the coalition... So I've been on record as saying I actually would have preferred to go in with, with Sinn Féin, actually, because there was a lot of talk about national government. 
Um, there's no other way of putting it that was that was a load of bull. I thought that wasn't going to happen. There wasn't going to be Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and Sinn Féin. It didn't make sense. And, you know, unfortunately, Fianna Fáil were going to be the kingmakers. But I'm not going to say, unfortunately, of course, you want to be in government, but it means there's a difficult decision if you have an issue with what party you might go in with. And it was always going to be Fianna Fáil with either Sinn Féin or Fine Gael. And I would have picked uh, Sinn Féin personally. Um, I don't know <laughs> what I think now, but... There's no point dwelling on it too much. Um, I wasn't happy at the start, but the minute the result was announced that we were in government, I looked at it positively. And so did so many other members of, of Fianna Fáil and over Fianna Fáil and said, look, we actually, we're in government now. No matter who we're with, we have to go try and effect positive change. We have the chance. Take it with both hands. There's no point giving out about it. And here we are. But I may as well just say I'm happy enough to go in with the, the Greens. And Rob's a nice lad as well, so that certainly helps. <laughs> but um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, Rob, we'll move on to you because your story, I think, is a bit more forged through fire than the rest of them, uh, considering this what has happened with the Young Greens in recent months. But kind of give us a walk through on kind of, first of all, uh, similar to both uh, Brian and Art as to why you first got involved with the Greens and then why you decided to run for president of the Green Party, of the Young Greens. Yeah, the, 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 that latter question is quite fast, as so I'll say that last. Um, I actually only joined up with the Greens. I, I got my renewal um yesterday for my two-year anniversary um, I joined in 2019 when a lot of people did and uh, it's been a, a, a bit of a roller coaster since then and not always in a nice way um, I joined because I wanted to put my energy which was you know passionate about social justice into something which I thought you know had a bigger picture here and that's climate justice because we are going down a very dangerous road here and I feel like yes public awareness has come uh, a long way, particularly in the last two or three years, but there's still an awful lot more to do and we really need people to be brave in politics and I wanted to be a part of that. So uh, since 2019 um, and, and up to the point of me becoming chairperson uh, of the Young Greens there about two months ago, um, well, the, the big uh, decision maker for a lot of people was uh, the decision to go into government. Um, I think the Greens, uh, when you look at us, you know, Ten years ago, we almost disappeared as a party. The youth wing was decimated; it just didn't exist, basically, for a few years, except for as, as a, um, a you know a shell organisation. That maybe there were some individuals around, but it wasn't super structured. Um, a lot of that was rebuilt back up, and it was rebuilt back up by activists, people who were working with NGOs, people who were volunteering with local community groups. And I suppose it's very difficult to transfer that energy into a, a political sense sometimes. Um, and people were very hurt um, by decisions that were made in terms of the programme for government and also the way they had been treated uh, after, you know, giving months and years of their lives into an organisation. So they've since left. Um, coming past um, the programme for government and, and are entering into government, I actually had very similar feelings uh, as Brian um, there. I was hoping, given the result that was there, of course, I had a very you know, ideal one in, in my mind. But yeah, I did think first we should have had a, a national government. It wouldn't have lasted very long probably, but you know, it was COVID and we didn't know where we were going. Then it would have been a Sinn Féin, Fianna Fáil, Greens and whoever else in there. I thought that was probably um, going to be better for, for my priorities. Um, and that didn't happen. We are where we are. Um, and a lot of more Greens have left as certain decisions have been made by Green Party ministers, Green Party TDs and the government in general. Um, the reason I'm still around, and I think that's a, a, an important thing to, to add on here, um, I think the Green movement is bigger than the Green Party in Ireland. There are There's class stuff going on in Green parties in Europe and across the world, and this is much bigger than this one term in government. I know our policies are sound, they're evidence-based, they will work in the real time, and we're not ignoring uh, the crises that are to come. And I know that, it, it, not to say that I will be right in 10, 20 years' time, but I know my goals are there in the right direction. I still do think the Green Party are, are um, the vehicle there at the moment, and I'm hoping I can also steer them back in some of the, the, the direction I would like them to go back into as well. So that's why we're still here. And I think there's a lot of people still in the Greens uh, and the young Greens who, who kind of, Took a while to come to that um, stance. I definitely did. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still here. Yeah, I, I want to touch on quickly before I move on to the next question. But again with again with the Greens though, Rob, I always have this sort of 
itching question every time I talk about it. Like people talk about the Greens being decimated back after the Fianna Fáil government. Like, is it not heading in a similar direction again? You froze on me there, Orn. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> hey, no question for me. Moving on. So. <laughs> can you hear me there now, guys? Yeah, yeah okay well good that we have the, the stuff recording so can you hear me there now guys you're back now yeah okay yeah no stop me in my stride obviously the internet doesn't want to work i mean we could talk about the broadband scheme but i don't want to get on a tangent um <laughs> we'll um I, i'll pick off anyways from where you left off rob uh, what did you catch before i sort of i suppose left this world indefinitely no perfect. nothing no. okay yeah. perfect okay that's grand like start from the beginning so start again and again um I want to talk about a little bit with you, Rob, about the position of the Greens. Obviously, you mentioned the whole sort of thing about, you know, why am I still in the Greens, which I think is a particularly valid question at this stage, given that a lot of people are asking Green Party members that question. Um, you know, you talked about how the party was decimated after its term in government with Fianna Fáil. Are we not seeing a repeat of that in some circumstances? You know, the Green Party before the election, you know, made a lot of promises that it hasn't stuck to. Now, granted, you can say that the concessions made uh, were, I suppose, for the greater good of the climate bill, uh, for the, I suppose, the work done by Roderick O'Gorman with regards to direct provision and whatnot. But, you know, stuff like, uh, for example, one that really, I suppose, itched people the wrong way, specifically from an environmental standpoint, was their position on CETA changing so drastically from before the election. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, a lot of people left... Uh, after the last uh, term in government and then it was built up by activists is it not kind of a slap on the face of those activists that really didn't want to go back into this government again to kind of pretty much repeat history's mistakes nearly yeah and there was 24 percent of us who voted against it uh, and I, I also know that a lot of people who did vote in favor of the program of government didn't they felt very conflicted um but i suppose the if you look at the, the the pillars of the Green Party, one of them is, is climate action. And, you know, time is running out here. And I suppose that that was the big deciding factor um, for for people. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Sorry, your question was a bit more broad, though, uh, if you can. Yeah, just surrounding. Is it more of a like a, repeat, are we repeating a repetition history? of history? Yes. Yeah. Um, I hope not. I think there's a much higher awareness of the importance of climate action and um, more parties are taking it on board. That to me is a success. It's we don't own the green agenda, um, although we have been pushing it for 40 years. Um, so like it, it's a difficult one, particularly when you see very talented and, and, and you know, people who passionate people who move away from the organization. But for me, like I, I work in youth organizations, I see they're they're more active than ever. They're probably not with the Greens. Um, but they might be, you know, with other parties, Sock Dem, Sinn Féin, uh, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, whatever it is. And as long as every um, youth wing and, and every party is taking on board the policies, it's not a lost cause. Uh, and we've been successful in that. Um, will we be decimated after the next two elections, local and, and um, national? Potentially. Um, but I do believe, and it's taken me a while to come to this, that the programme for government and the actions that are being taken right now are inherently better with the Greens in there. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly in comparison to who might be in there, which would be a, a rake of independence who, you know, based off a lot of comments that have, have been coming out, you know, on the Climate Action Bill in particular, uh, and, and on other issues to do with COVID, um, that, that's not, that wouldn't have been a very healthy government, I don't think, and it wouldn't have been good for the people of Ireland, particularly in the long term. So mm -hmm. that's, that's as much as I can say on that. Do you not, but you know, and, and just kind of follow up on that, you talk about, you know, it's it's a better government with the Greens in it. Do you not then trust your government partners to push a green agenda as well? Uh, well, I mean, there, there's a reason we're in different parties. <laughs> um, I think there's a, better, a bigger understanding, particularly from certain individuals. But, you know, there is, uh, there's difficult decisions to be made here, particularly with ag, um, agriculture, um, cap reform. You know, we, we clearly disagree uh, on a lot of things. There, a, a lot of this um, discussions around Antashka and, and uh, the court cases and things like that, like that, I just fundamentally disagree with. And that's an ideological thing, but it's it's also something that it requires brave decisions to be made. And I, I don't like, you know, it, it's come down to individual politicians um, if, saying whatever, but, uh, who are members of, of other parties in, in the government. So, no, I, I think we need to be there to make sure that that uh, happens and that that happens right. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's why it's it's also you know with so little time left, uh, and now that we're you know obliged to hit these these targets uh, for emissions, um, it, it's good that we have gotten in there, and I acknowledge that now. Mm-hmm. Um, Brian, I want to throw a question over to you. Um, obviously, this government was formed in the midst of probably what well the most uh, tragic pandemic that any government could have wished to have been born into. Was it a wise decision for the current government to switch the health minister in the middle of a pandemic? I know a lot of people would disagree with that uh, or would disagree with changing it. Um, I, I don't know how much of a bearing it's it, it's really had on it. I know some people have had issues with communication, but, you know, bad communication, obviously not ideal. It doesn't stop you for, from doing the job at hand, uh, to be honest. And you even look at the vaccine rollout at the moment. You know, a few months back, a lot of people were giving out about it and how, you know, it was the government's fault and this and that. But it's quite clear that the issue was actually supply and the government have done a pretty good job of ensuring that that supply would get out there into the public realm. Um, so, like, looking back on it, I think, obviously, there may have been a few embarrassing moments, but I, I don't think it was an issue at all. You see, mm-hmm. look, Simon Hart, in my opinion, I don't agree on what Art thinks <laughs> or what Art can actually say. I don't think he was a good health minister and I think he needed to change. You know, he might have dealt well with the pandemic. That's fair enough. Health is more than the pandemic as well. And we're going to have long existential issues to grapple with after the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was appropriate to change uh, to change the health minister. And it's just, it's going to happen uh, naturally enough. Fianna Fáil were very keen to get the health portfolio, as with housing, to try and actually make an impact there and make a positive change because it needed to be done. And I think it needed to be changed up as well. I've no real issue with that. I think people will look back on it kindly bar a few embarrassing moments. Yeah. Um, it kind of leads on into a good topic and I want to talk to you, Art, about it a little bit. Um, you know, we've all seen the sort of division with this government. Now, a lot of people have said, does it work? Does it not? A lot of people are saying, well, you have two Taoiseachs technically because nobody knows who to look for for guidance at this stage. Some will look to Michal Martin, some will look to Leo Varadkar. You know, I think even Fianna Fáil's parliamentary party will acknowledge that as well. I, I think they should probably host their parliamentary party meetings in public at this stage, given the leaks that come out from them. Uh, one of which was that I think they... I can't remember if it was Jim O'Callan at the time that said that, you know, Micheál Martin was being taken to town on pretty much everything with regards to COVID by Leo Varadkar. Uh, is that, has that had a negative impact on the country? Because as Brian mentioned, you know, Simon Harris, he was, you know, and we all know he was the former Minister for Health. He didn't think he was a particularly good Minister for Health. Um, but he has kind of, to a lot of people, not left that portfolio behind. He is still acting as this sort of, I suppose, shadow minister for health while also being in government and holding a completely different brief, that being third level education, which for a lot of third level students, Simon hasn't done very much with. How is this government, I suppose, in your mind working specifically for third level students and Simon Harris and how is he been dealing with it? And do you think that there needs to be a fundamental shift in how the government works overall? Because at the moment, it seems to a lot of people that it's all very much who's seen to be giving the orders because that's who the electorate will listen to. Yeah, no, there's some, there's three great aspects to, to what you asked me. The first was the, the Leo and Michal dynamic. The second, uh, Simon Harris and how the government operates. On the, on the question of Leo Varadkar and Michal Martin, I suppose, look, it's, it's important to acknowledge that the structure of the government is an equal partnership government. Um, That was what we agreed to. Uh, We effectively achieved the same vote, the same mandate from the public, and um, the government is there to reflect that. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to have a mixture of fresh heads with experience in the cabinet. Um, I don't think it's it's an unusual setup as a government in that there's, as far as I know, no other member state of the European Union at the moment that has an agreement where they have a rotating prime minister. Uh, I think there was an attempt in Israel recently enough that I'm not that there seems to be a new government or an election every time you look over your shoulder there. But um, with that, there was always going to be teething difficulties, and I think it would be naive to think that if a former Taoiseach and soon to be future Taoiseach wouldn't have um, a pretty prevailing um, an opinion and uh, decisiveness as as part of them. And I think it was. A wonderful brief that Leo Varadkar decided to take, and I think it showed Fine Gael's commitment to making sure that we 
we build back an economy that first of all make sure that there is a job for everybody who wants a job which is one of the, the greatest avenues out of out of poverty on, on the on the simon harris side of things i would say um it's possibly a little bit unfair to criticize any minister for talking about health in the middle of a public health emergency uh the truth is um that is policy decision making that every department has to deal with at the moment relates to COVID, and it's quite difficult not to give a contribution on views of the day not least when you are a minister in that department for four years i don't think it's necessarily fair to say that simon's department um has failed students that the main commitment that was given um was a return to campuses in September, and that will happen. Um, we have seen um, through working with Simon's cooperation with the Minister for Housing, Dara O'Brien, um, movement on student accommodation, and there's still certainly issues there, and we can see those in UCD. But I mean, the other aspect of that department is research, innovation, and science. And there is a huge, huge amount going on there at the moment as well. The government is launching a national strategy on research and innovation at the moment which could secure the bones of a hundred thousand jobs in life sciences as we move forward beyond covid and, and with that investment in higher education and then the last thing you were asked about was how the government works like i mean i think every coalition is going to have teething problems the the first Fine Gael labor coalition 10 years ago would say lost quite a number of tds over the course of its term um the minority government that was the last government also had teething difficulties where members of the independent alliance weren't necessarily comfortable with taking the whip on certain things and again the government lost a few members and I think it's inevitable that this government will lose members as well um, I genuinely think this one of all the three or even of the last four or five is probably the most lacklustre and dysfunctional and I still do think that we have a long way to go to break down the legacy of suspicion of one another that's been built up over a century in the case of Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, but over many years as well between the different parties. But like, I mean, I didn't want us to return to government, but I think now that we're all here, we have a, a patriotic responsibility to make the government work. I'm not convinced the government in the last five years, but I do think while we're there, you're right. I think it's important that we, we act as grown-ups and we take collective responsibility and the youth wings as well. I mean, I think I was I wasn't sure what the dynamic might be this evening. You know, I and usually it would be the case that we say all of our own departments are doing great and every other department is the disaster. I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think there's some good work being done in different in different departments. And I think the message from government as a whole is there actually is a lot happening. Um but you never know. Hopefully things might improve on the on the the personal side of things. I think um I think there has been to an extent. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about third level education, because you rightfully brought up that there is a commitment for college students to go back to campus this year. And, uh, you know, with current projections, you know, I'm not going to make too much of a commitment to current projections because they tend to vary very much. And obviously, as Brian mentioned, depending on supply and what comes in and what comes out. And, you know, some might argue it's the problem with the government. Some might say, well, no, it's a problem with the provider. And that's a completely different story. But there is a commitment that I suppose everyone above 20 will be fully vaccinated by the end of September. Now, that leaves out a very big majority of college students, particularly those in the 18 and 19 year old age, who will be going to college either for the first time or going into their second year after a year of being stuck at home. You know, is it a bit rushed to say that everyone should be going back to campus? Like, because, you know, we've seen the level of dysfunctionality between different universities over the last year with regards to providing adequate student accommodation, you know, providing... I suppose, adequate rents for students as well. And then also making it an experience at home feel like it's worthwhile as opposed to what a lot of people did after they got their CEO applications, which was defer a year. So what are the opinion on that? I suppose, Ard, I will start with you again because you raised the point, but I, this is something I want all three of the uh, people here tonight to answer with regards to, are the government rushing back again? Because we saw this problem back in Christmas and that was a that was a small I suppose hiccup in the term of things where people wanted to get back out and they wanted to I suppose enjoy Christmas while I was there but are we seeing this kind of almost giddy approach to going back to college on campus and trying to promise something that realistically if we were to look at it and if it snowballed again we could see another lockdown um I, I, I'll go first and say no I, I I do think that this needs to happen um, we'll all agree that there's a desire to make sure that we um, accelerate and we have accelerated our vaccine rollout. Um, and I think, look, hopefully those targets will be met. 
But we need to be careful about the comparisons that we make. The country is in a very different situation and certainly will be in a very different situation come September than where we were at Christmas. Um, I think there has to be a pathway towards the restoration of normal civil liberties and it starts with a renewal of that social contract which the government has towards younger people, which I think has largely been fractured over the course of this pandemic. Not necessarily directly the government's responsibility, even though it might be partly, but just some of the prevailing dialogue and mantra that has gone on that, um, you know, the, the people who have probably sacrificed the most, who sacrificed the best years of their lives and will be the last to return to their liberties. I think it would be a massive, massive failure of government to turn around to the class of leaving certs this year who won't have their debs, who won't have their you know, a, a proper night maybe to celebrate their results or or whatever else. Um, and of course, the second years as well, who lost even more, who d- d- equally d- didn't have their first year in college. Um, to say that one more semester at home, I think the societal impact would be enormous. And I think you have to weigh up decisions in government that that move just beyond the edict of Nefid. Um, and I'm not taking a, a dig at Nefid or anything like that, even though I'm, I know it's becoming quite a popular thing to do, but I, it, government has to take holistic, nuanced decisions. And I, we, we need to look at the impact that has for young people. So I'd be interested to hear what the lads have to say on that as well. Yep. Um, Brian or Rob, which one of you would like to jump in on this? No, you're you're both too polite. Uh, go on, Rob, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll come in very fast. Um, yeah, if, if you had asked me this question months ago or even, you know, before last September, I would have said something different. But yeah, I, I do think Art is right that the public buy-in and, and tolerance and patience uh, isn't really there um, after this very, very long lockdown. Um, like, uh, yeah, and it's that particular cohort as well. You know, they, they've sat inside in classrooms with each other um, six years going into first year next year. Um, it, you can't really just change the rules entirely for it. It'll have to be managed. Um, I mean, there's there's interesting approaches they, that could be looked at in terms of, you know, sharing out the vaccines, uh, particularly when we come under, say, 25 years of age, because it's, to break the chains of transmission, it's more so about getting as many people across all age levels rather than leaving, you know, all the first years, you know, becoming a COVID hotspot or, or whatever. Um, that could be explored. I'm not a health expert, but... Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we'll, the, the buy-in is there and to expect people to ask uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. Brian? Uh, yeah, I want to agree with the lads as well. To be fair, I think we have to get her level students back in September mm-hmm. um, or during the normal time. Um, like Education is vitally important to a child's development and a young adult's development as well. And I'd be thinking of, you know, someone who was in, fifth year, in the academic year of 2019 and 2020 and the disruption that was caused there and then last year as well doing their leaving cert and having the choice there um although the government did a good job getting them back into schools so i think absolutely outstanding i believe because education is so important but first year is coming into your first year from a vulnerable background or a working class background or any minority background i think you're probably more likely to drop out in first or second year before you can get the grips with things and, you know, education as a great leveler, if you drop out after, you know, first year, because you're not given uh, as much chance to progress in society and in education as someone from a, a better off background, that's a disaster. And that can have long lasting impacts on your whole life. And so I think, you know, like it's, you know, it could be all well and good for someone who is, you know, has access to broadband. Um, you know, someone who's better off and has parents who can make sure that they can work from home when they go to college. But, you know, for the more vulnerable students, like I just keep thinking of someone from my background. My par- I could have told my parents I'm on the computer doing college work and they wouldn't know any better because they're not used to it. Um, and it's the same with the leaving cert as well. It just wouldn't work. And it would have a lot more long lasting effects, I think, on society. And, you know, it dreads me to think of the long, long lasting effects that, that, that it's had on vulnerable students already. Mm-hmm. Um, to be honest with you, I'd be curious to see that. But I think it's vitally important to get people back. Uh, the promise has been made. Um, you know, I know not every teenager will be vaccinated by then, um, or very little of them will be. But I think, you know, we'll probably have reached near enough level of herd immunity that it can be reasonably safe once the pre- appropriate precautions are taken, of course. Like, I've no doubt everything will be done possible mm-hmm. to ensure that it is as safe as possible. 
But we've made that promise now, uh, and it has to be it has to be done because the long lasting effects of people not getting back into normal education and can be detrimental to a, to any human's development. And you know, that's what I think about most. But the promise is made, so let's deliver on it, and let's work to deliver on it as well. Mm-hmm. You mentioned obviously, kind of um, almost providing. You know, it's easier for people with good broadband to you know, attend online college. And, you know, we've had an example of that already tonight. So, uh, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about that. I just want to mention very briefly, because was it a bit naive of the government in some sense to kind of say, OK, it'll be grand, everyone, you know, you have to work from home now. Like, reasonably, you know, you talk about certain areas, like I know particularly a lot of people in Dublin will be quite lucky with good internet, but you go to the rural parts of the country, particularly, I think, of the likes of Sligo, that probably don't have the best broadband connection and haven't been, I suppose, the best recipients of the broadband scheme, although I, I, I beg the question as to who has been a good recipient of the broadband scheme. You know, should they have realistically prepared a bit more? Or should they have done more over the year to put better infrastructure in place for broadband? Um, I'll I'll ask you, Brian, this first, just because it was raised on that question. Yeah, uh, well, I think when the when the pandemic first began, um, you know, at the beginning of twenty twenty, there was absolutely no choice. I know I'm talking about vulnerable students and the the digital divide um, across the country for whatever reason, either access to broadband, actually having it in your area, or simply not being able to afford it. Mm-hmm. But you know, there there was no choice. You know, school had to stop. Um, and I think it was that's why it was vitally important that you had to get children back into school last year. And that's what the government did. You got, and I was a fierce advocate for that. I know a lot of people were against it. I know teacher unions were against it. I'm a member of it. I've sipped to it myself. I understand it from that point of view. Um, but education is so so vitally important. And then you look at you know this stage, what could the government have done over the last year? Maybe little things, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, I don't know how much progress could have been made in the year to actually change that. Um, like I said, even if everyone did have access to broadband, you know, you still have issues with, with certain students. Like, oh, you know, I would have had those issues anyway. So it's it's not the be all and end all. It's a massive advantage uh, to people. And it's massive, a massive advantage to you know, people from our, our off background, of course. But um, I don't know if there's much more the government could have done. Um, it's a, you know, <laughs> like broadband in this country is you know, not at a good level as it is. Mm-hmm. And there are commitments there to change that, of course, but it's not going to be done overnight. It's, you know, like CD impacts on housing, for example, you know, we're behind schedule purely because you don't have the, the manpower there because we couldn't work during COVID. And it's the same across all sectors, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you need people out you know, digging holes, laying lines. And um, I know now it's, it's, it's easy enough to say people can work outside, but we didn't know that at the time. You know, so it's like I think it's understandable that the government weren't fully prepared. I think they've done the best in a, in a bad situation. But you know, the solution to, to that, getting people back into schools, getting people back into well, they are back in schools already, getting people back into college and making sure it's as safe as possible. Mm-hmm. All right, I'll throw the question over to you as well because obviously your your party were the one that very heavily promoted the broadband scheme to begin with. Could they have done more? I know obviously they couldn't have predicted COVID. I don't think anyone could have, but could they have done more in their time in government to have pushed out the broadband scheme i think i mean it's, it's important to know i suppose that Fine Gael were the party and were the government that proposed the national broadband plan at the time the national broadband plan was opposed by the green party uh, Fianna Fáil supported but uh, uh, supported a delay after um the fiasco of dennis dennis nocton but i think there is a recognition across parties that the national broadband plan and having a national um strategy for making sure that People have equal opportunities regardless of what region of the country they live in is is a is a really a really great endeavor i'm 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 not necessarily sure we could have done an awful lot more on where we were at the time um it's it's you know lo- looking back now it's it's hard to say i know a lot you know people would say you know these things should have been done in um, at, an, at an earlier stage but i guess look the the country in the the formative years of that, that coalition government wasn't really in a, in a financial situation to to launch that at any at an earlier point but i think the more interesting question is where we go from here and that's where i think the government is is really really showing vision for the future and i mean i think one of the most impressive documents that has been launched by any government um is um that which uh, heather Humphreys has put forward on rural development moving forward and the idea that 
remote working and a green and digital transition could sustain and revive rural Ireland. And it might not necessarily be the case that, you know, people in a year's time or two years time will be working in a box room like I am now. But there, but we can possibly return and hopefully will return to a situation where you have enterprise hubs across towns in Ireland, across villages in Ireland, where the person in the desk beside you doesn't necessarily have the same empl employer, but they're still your colleague. You still retain some class of a, of a, an office atmosphere and that we have a hybrid moving forward. And I think, you know, COVID, COVID will certainly have a long-term fallout economically, socially, politically, that we're going to have to come to terms with for, in, for the next few years. A lot of that we will not realise until well afterwards. I think I was reading an article today about it, this, this statistically like five-year-olds in the United Kingdom and their, the, the propensity to have panic attacks by meeting their, their, um, their friends because they had been so unused to the social interaction side of things. We'll learn about these things in years to come, but hopefully equally there is an opportunity to, to learn from it. And I think what COVID has done is it's allowed us to have a conversation about the future of work that we probably wouldn't have had for another seven or eight, maybe nine years um, had we not had a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um, let's move on to a, a topic now that has very much dominated, I think, the the discussion of Irish politics, uh, not only pre-pandemic, uh, but also still to this day, uh, and it's the housing crisis. Um, it's kind of the key focal point of this upcoming by-election as well in Dublin Bay South that's been uh, purported by a lot of the media organisations and, of course, a load of the candidates themselves. You know, there's still over 8,000 people homeless on the streets, over 2,000 of them are children, uh, Brian, obviously, currently, and I can't speak to obviously the whole uh, housing development because we had uh, various years with Owen Murphy as the housing minister. But Daryl O'Brien is the current housing minister. How do you think this current government has handled uh, housing as a whole and the homelessness crisis? Well, you know, when you ask these questions, I, I have opinions on how Finnegall dealt with housing before, or you know, specifically about about this government right now with the Green Party, uh, Fianna Fáil, and Finnegall involved. And I think. Since we've taken the portfolio, I know with support from the other parties, I think it's done as well as it can. Um, to be honest with you, I know the housing delivery is down this year, but that's simply because people couldn't work because of the pandemic. Yeah, it's very unfortunate that we're behind because of that, but that's just the way the way it is, unfortunately. Um, but you've seen a lot of a lot of moves. The government has certainly changed tack to try and you know, make a difference and try to deliver that housing stock, social housing and affordable housing. Um, and I think we're going, to, we're going to see the benefits in a few years. I think it's still probably a little bit early to, to judge Dara O'Brien. I think after being a year in government, you would have hoped that you'd see a lot of delivery now or under the current circumstances. Um, it's, it's nearly impossible. Like I said, we are we are behind. You know, bringing in things like the affordable housing bill, like that's going to make a massive difference. It delivers affordable housing, delivers a cost rental scheme, which is also badly needed, and it gives a commitment to deliver social housing as well. Um, so, like, I think we might see some issues in September with student accommodation. I'd be curious to see how that actually works out. Um, to be honest, I can only see things getting worse. But it's a, it's a problem that obviously isn't going to be changed overnight. But I think the government has, you know, made the right moves to try and increase the housing stock. Even you know, getting more vacant homes back into the into the housing stock. You know, that's going to make a that's going to make a massive difference as well. And it's been a massive source of frustration for citizens of this country over the last few years when you see empty houses and then you see homeless people on the streets you know it's not good enough and I think it's estimated that there's something up to 90,000 housing units across the country that are underutilized be it vacant homes or I don't know what the other reasons are but I know um was space above shops in Dublin city centre for example you know and trying to actually utilize that that brings 90,000 houses into the stock. That's two or three years worth of, of houses. That's going to make a huge difference as well. Um, so I think the government's been very proactive and have done what they, they can do so far. And obviously, you know, a massive issue that you'll see down the line is the rejection of uh, housing developments by elements of the left, letting ideology get in the way. I don't like seeing developers get money. I don't think they should, but I think it's necessary because the state simply cannot build enough houses to cater for everyone alone and if that's why you know the land development agency i know a lot of councillors have issues with that but the reason for that that they think their powers are being reduced is because of you know left-wing parties rejecting the housing left right and center 
just because someone's getting a, a bit more cash. Like I said, I don't agree with it, but the state simply can't supply enough housing on its own. And we just want to increase supply, and we're doing absolutely everything to do that. It's going to drive down prices. It's going to drive down rents. Um, you know, and then there hopefully will be a housing or a housing referendum as well, which means that the state is obliged to provide housing to absolutely everyone. And that's going to make a massive difference too. I don't think people realise that. But the government has been very good on it so far. Perhaps a bit too early to judge, but they've definitely made a lot of positive, proactive moves. Mm-hmm. Just, just to follow up on that. Now, I know you mentioned that obviously the state can't provide you know, housing for everyone, that would be great, you know, and that you need to, there needs to be a sort of a balance between uh, paying it out to developers to develop these properties and whatnot. But then if a, if a right in the constitution is enshrined that everyone has a right to a house, how is that going to work then? Because if they don't have the money then, if they don't have the money now, sorry, how are they magically going to get all this money to build those houses then? Oh, well, money's cheap at the moment. <laughs> or it has to be done. If the ESRI are recommending it, it's obviously a sensible thing to do. You know, but why wait? Um, why wait until the referendum then? Why not just do it now? Oh, they should be doing it anyway. <laughs> but I think it'll avoid the situation in future. Like it is something that that people want. I think it's very important that we do avoid that in future. And I, but just to clarify, I actually want the the state to provide all housing where possible. Um, it's actually more to do with the actual building of housing. But the state just doesn't have the power to actually build all the houses themselves, like we used to back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, just to clarify that. Yeah. Um. Rob, obviously, uh, I kind of I feel poor in a yeah, way because I am kind of rare to come in on this one. Now, sorry, to <laughs> ask your question. No, I I am uh, to my own fault as well, prioritizing probably uh, some of the other portfolios. But obviously, you know, Claire Byrne, the recent candidate for the Greens in Dublin Bay South, has also made a commitment that a big priority for her is going to be housing. Are the Greens offering anything different to what the current government parties are looking at, or are they kind of similar enough in that case? Because it's easy for a government TD to be, well, I, I think particularly I take the, the idea from James Gagan, who said that he wants to be the voice for a locked out generation, which, I mean, personally, uh, this probably goes against a lot of things. I, I don't really think he is the voice for that, considering his background. Um, But if we look at, you know, if a government person, if somebody who's running for a governmental position or to be a government TD how are they going to shake up what is already the current system for housing? Yeah, I, I'm going to be a bit provocative here, um, but I'm also trying to be respectful. Like, I, This is the one part of government where I'm deeply unhappy with. Um, and then it comes down to the numbers thing where we are 12 TDs out of 84 in government and, and we can only get certain a certain amount through. I We're totally opposed, particularly to Fianna Gael um, housing policy. Um and I, I get angry when when I, I see and frustrated when when I see us trying to get our policy through. Um, Fianna Fáil, I see is a bit more malleable. Um, and to be fair, I know Francis Noel Duffy, who's our housing spokesperson, has done some good work with, with Dara um, on uh, housing. But it, the simple solution is is cost rental. Um, Sinn Féin says it. We say it. The SRI say it. So many other bodies and experts are, are saying it. And unfortunately it just doesn't it, it will bring down housing prices it will take away the focus of housing being an, a potential investment which is going to harm certain people certain individuals um this is where the lobbyists come in like uh, you know brian i'm also going to disagree with you now as well uh, on the the building housing at any costs like i'm sitting here in rings end i'm looking over onto capital dock and every like loads of those uh, build, or apartments in that building are empty and that's the housing system that we have created, that it is an asset that can be sat on. And, you know, we, we saw it all come out that, oh, it's not just apartment blocks. It, it's it's houses that are being bought up by these funds. And there has been some tightening on that. But what else has not been uncovered? Um, I, I don't, you know, I rent. I, I rent in Dublin. Uh, I, I'm not, I have nothing to gain from this. And, and I think our entire generation and, and maybe 10 years above me as well, we're, we're all locked out of it. I don't see the point of protecting the status quo anymore. Like people are leaving, uh, you know, really talented people who are coming to Ireland and Dublin to work in tech companies, whatever, they're gone or they're going. People are moving out of the country or out to the country. It's not working uh, and it's affecting people so much in terms of quality of life uh, and what we we can actually spend our time on and you know this all connects up to the social contract being broken you you can work hard and not be able to afford to live god forbid you know you you have kids 
in Dublin. Like it's just unaffordable unless you're on a really, really amazing wage. And this is where I'm deeply unhappy with the fact that we're still in government uh, on this. Um, and this is where I would disagree with a lot of other Green Party members on it. So I'm not going to defend the housing policy of the government because I can't. I can't stand above it. Um, there are some, once again, to turn that, there are some good things, I think, happening. Um, Francis Duffy uh, um, got through some cost rental units. Um, they were, there was a press release in the last month um, of down in like step aside. Uh, and that, I suppose, is the test. And we'll see actually what people, what rents they're paying. It should be up to about 40% lower than, um, the, than the normal cost of rent in that area. So let's see. I'm hoping the other parties, and I will say it because I think Fianna Fáil is a little less ideologically opposed to, to our housing policy, if they come on board, because that's what's needed. Um, and I think our policy works and we know it works. Mm -hmm. And uh, I leave it at that because I get very riled up about this. Right, Jared, I'm going to throw the, I suppose, the hot potato over to you in this case. Um, cost rental, is it the way to go? I think it's naive to say there's a one-size-fits-all strategy or policy that's going to resolve the housing crisis. I, on, uh, this is, I suppose, a reason why we're in different political parties. I, a hill I would die on is um, the ability for somebody to still own their own home. And moreover, an ability to give that to their children when they pass on. I think I, 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 it is completely correct to acknowledge that we're in a crisis and we have been in a crisis for several years. And there are a number of reasons behind that. Certainly Fine Gael has not gotten everything right on this. And I'm not here to be a mouthpiece for the party or the government and, and say that we've gotten everything right. But what I would say is that I think it would be a dreadful sacrifice as a nation and as a nation i don't i'm not a person who views this the i won't say lost but the desire the desire of home ownership as being something inherently bad um and i i do think that there are the one size fits all strategy is not one that's necessarily going to remedy everything i do think it's it's welcome that we see um specific policy trials in different areas and let's see how things work. But I mean, there are a number of things to consider here as well. Um, when we consider objections uh, among, on, on, on ideological grounds, I find it in a crisis to be unjustifiable. And it is also the truth that not alone can the state can't provide everybody with housing, but not everybody wants the state to provide them with housing. And I think that's often a point that's lost. And I think they as, as a nation that in the recent past has seen the collapse and complete and utter um, dysfunction of, a, of our banking system and the consequences that that had for the housing sector, I would be concerned that it, an attitude would prevail that a dysfunctional lending system would also be desirable. And I think the policy decisions that we make around this area could have an undesirable and unintended consequence on that front. I, I do think that the loss of the fact that we're now effectively down to about three banks in the country is not a good thing for the state. Um, and I think we have to be very, very careful about the unintended consequences which we have with, with the policies that we bring in. But I would acknowledge that um, the government has made progress, this new government has made progress on this. I think um, I would, like every good patriot, would be willing on the Minister for Housing and, and hoping that we, um, that we find solutions in this because I think the greatest injustice our society has at the moment um, or any society would have is the idea that people are living on the streets or people are without a home and especially children who um, who are being dispossessed of their their future and of their present and I, and I think we're all in agreement there and I you know I think it's important as well that when we talk about these things um, that we talk about ideas and, and policies and not individuals and I've always think we you know on Murphy like him or loathe them, it was it's very important in politics because eventually, you know, everybody every every major political party will find themselves in government at some point that we that we respect people's um their own actual motivation and maybe not question that. And I think that's something that um um is often lost in this debate. But I just want to bring up the, the whole topic surrounding whether you know, Ireland seems to have this romanticized idea 
of uh, particularly a lot of the time and this is speaking from my own personal opinion but the stats on this back this up as well is that Ireland for the most part uh, particularly with people living here have always for some reason prioritized that home ownership is the end goal of everything you know the majority of European pe- counterpart countries are very much involved in rental schemes and people rent their homes in uh, places like Spain, Portugal, uh, Germany and France to a certain extent. Like, is that to be said though, that like for the years, Ireland has very much prioritized housing. And now that we have a lack of that housing, the cracks in the rental system are really showing. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you'd like people to be able to to, you know, grow up and uh, be able to, uh, you know, give their house off to their child. But for a lot of people, you know, that's an ideal situation. There's going to be some people who won't have uh, that certain upbringing or, you know, people who don't grow up with, uh, you know, with a single parent or whatnot, who just viably cannot uh, source a lot of that, um, a lot of the income to, first of all, buy a home in the extremely expensive housing market. But then also for people who realistically aren't looking to house themselves on a permanent basis, you know, people who want to have that option to particularly rent, whether it's in Dublin or in the countryside or anywhere else, without feeling like, you know, you know, I think the most recent ESRI report showed that, you know, most people are spending more on rent than what they would be on a month if they were to go for a mortgage for a house. You know, I, like I fail to see in, in some cases how that's a how that's a common strategy. Like if that doesn't show an overarching flaw in, I suppose, the government's proceedings with housing, maybe not so much in this government, but in previous governments, I don't really know what is then, Art. No, you're no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, 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 again, uh, don't mistake me. I mean, I come from a background where um, neither of my parents attended college either and, and one income owned a house. Um, and I think that desire, that aspiration is something that if we can incubate and protect it to the future is, is, is the desirable goal. And, and I, again, I'm, I'm certainly not defending the, idea, the situation that, which is, of course, true, that you could be renting at the moment um, and the rent that you pay, effectively dead money, is um, larger than what you would be paying if you were, um, if you were to get a mortgage. And I think... Um, a, se- a central uh, task that the government, the current government as well, will have to um, will have to address is making sure that we can return to a functioning um, lending market as well. That people, whether it's um, one income or two incomes, but if p- people should be able to access the credit that they need to purchase the kind of accommodation that they're desiring, um, that's fit for purpose to them. Um, and I think we still have an awful long way to go there. Um, and I, there are a number of reasons behind that. Um, I, I would be wrong and, not, and, and I would be arrogant to start suggesting that I'm a policy expert on housing. Um, but I, I do think it's um, on, the, on the lending side, it's absolutely right. And, and Brian mentioned that we, are, we find ourselves in a situation where um, credit is quite cheap at the moment for, um, for state bonds. It, it should be the case. I do think that we shouldn't be afraid of making sure that we can make credit more accessible to ordinary people as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say if anyone wants to jump in the, on this point, because I know I've kept you over an hour, um, I will finish off after this one with a, a final question. But if anyone wants to jump in here, feel free to go ahead now. Uh, Rob, I can see you're kind of itching to go there. Yeah, I, I will very fast. I, I suppose to be as a kind of new I know where the parties stand on this, um, but I mean, a lot of what Art said there, I find very problematic and I just don't agree with it. Like it, it's not so much about fixing the markets because it doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. Um, we, we can get very, very cheap loans from the European Central Bank and, and other lenders, as, as we know, and um, the markets are very good right now on, on 30 year um, you know, and and put that straight into this um, cost rental model, and that gives people that security. It's not going to get fixed. We know this. The experts know this. Um, and to be honest, I I don't really yeah. owning a house. Yeah, the goal. But if you cannot get out of the rental market until your forties, it, it, it you know you'll be paying a mortgage well, well into your your pension. That's not what uh, is is right here um, and and there's so much personal wealth here in Ireland that is tied up in property particularly with massive inflated uh, property prices and um, which you know is is another um, result of, of the rental and housing system that we have here that's just not right 
we need a quick solution that will fix this. There is one massive part of the market that is not being sorted, and that is people that just want to get by and save up for their mortgage or just live comfortably and, and you know, take a, a proportional amount of their income and not have to, uh, you know, live and, and move around between properties because they're unhappy and they get tossed out every year or two because that is the case as well right now. Security of tenure is the most important thing. That's when you can embed yourself in a community. That's when you, you can actually live and stop thinking about where you're going in the next few months and what your landlord might do. And it's all connected here. And that's where the ideology, unfortunately, is is different. Uh, and I know the Greens are trying their best in government, but it, we're very much in the minority here. And I, I think, I hope people vote next time around as well and note what actual policies um, parties are, are standing for. And I hope parties as well also realise what's important. There seems to have been a bit of a, a new reckoning uh, by everyone in government after um, the case of um, what was happening out in Kildare. But, you know, we, we need more than just the, the quick fixes that was there. We need a total revamp uh, and a new vision for housing in Ireland. And I think we and a lot of the opposition have it. It's up to the two the big boys in government <laughs> and the minister as well to, to take this on board. Mm-hmm. Um, if I suppose, well, either of you want to respond to that, I know less so for Brian, but more so for Arsh. But if, if Brian, if you want to jump in either, feel more than happy to. Yeah, I think we have a particular housing vision where you know we do want to offer choice. We want everyone to have the ability to own their own home, but we should also understand that some people will never aspire to that or... They might have unfortunately given up on that at the moment. I think the problems over the last 10 years may potentially last for some people for the next 20 or 30. You know, like Rob said and yourself, you're paying rent that's worth far more than a mortgage and it's just dead money and how much money has gone down the drain to a landlord over the last few years. It's, it's just not good enough. And we do need drastic action to take care of those people. And, you know, I, I believe we can live in a state where we can provide enough houses that are affordable, that people can buy. Um, I also think we should be able to uh, supply enough social housing so that every single person has a roof over their head. I also believe, although people may think it's unrealistic, that a single mother should be able to aspire to own their own home and that they shouldn't have to give up on that. You know, We all remember back in the day, and I know family have benefited, benefited from it, friends, where you pay rent to the council, dependent on your income, and eventually you own your own house. And there's so many people in Dublin who have benefited from that and other areas around the country. I think we can get back to that stage where everyone can have the type of home that they want. Um, so I don't know if we agree with both of the lads. I agree with home ownership, but you know, social housing is absolutely key as well. We have to make sure there's choice for absolutely everyone to ensure that everyone is catered for no matter what they want. And then just in reference to other countries in Europe as well, I know they have a different model and it may point to how our housing model is flawed obviously our housing model has been flawed over the last 10 years it would be ridiculous to to argue otherwise if we go back before that everyone had a house over their head you could own you could own a house or you know you could rent as long as you wanted or you got you got social housing and rented that way Mm -hmm. um you know if we get the model right it is a challenge for this government it's not going to be done during its term but we can put in place solid pillars to ensure that we can do that why can't other countries in Europe look at our system and say the Irish got their act together? The Irish system is good enough. Everyone has choice. You can own a home or you can rent as long as you want or a mix of both or whatever. Um, I think we should aspire to do that. Um, I know we've, you know, when it comes to education, for example, where were we 30 years ago, lagging behind the rest of Europe? But now when it comes to education, obviously there are lots of issues, but at least um, a lot of people have access to education in comparison to other countries. But we do still, uh, in comparison, have a pretty decent education system. You know, it might cost more for some people. I do understand that. Thankfully, I got a grant and thankfully other people get grants as well. And that enables people from vulnerable backgrounds to, to go to college. But, you know, most, I think we're the most educated uh, nation on the planet. Maybe I'm wrong. We're certainly up there. But we weren't like that 30 years ago. So you can change that much in 30 years. With the Climate Action Bill and a Climate Action Plan, we're looking to be a world leader on that. We're looking to make a massive sea change in how we deal with climate change. And why can't we have the same with housing? Why can't other countries in Europe in 10 or 15 years look at Ireland as the right model? And maybe more people in Europe will want to own their own home as well. 
Um, there are my thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. Um, Art, I'll leave you with the final word on this topic just to kind of round it off. Yeah, no, no, um, it's fantastic. And I, I, I would say I, I don't necessarily think that the, our housing policy before uh, 2011 was uh, w- was perfect. I, I, we, the IMF might disagree with us, but um, what, what I would say is this is, it goes back to the reason I suppose I was a bit hesitant about returning to government. I genuinely, and I, I fully respect uh, a policy's mandate from the electorate and for it to be tested out. And I do think, and I acknowledge and uh, that Rob and Brian as well had desired a coalition of the left or a coalition with Sinn Féin. And I think there will come a time where um, a lot of the alternative housing policies that have been advanced will be tested. And as a party of home, or, or home ownership, rather than, um, I suppose, cannibalizing other parties' policies, and you can call it fluidity or flexibility or whatever else when it comes to a core uh, credo of what uh, what your party stands for it would be something i would take deep issue with if we were to part ways with the idea um that somebody could own their own house and somebody could um could pass on their house or pass on their property and i do think that there will come a time where we will i suppose be an opposition party to this and we would be able to critique the elements of it and i think the hens will come home to roost and we, we, we will we will eventually see which policy works um mm-hmm. um i'll leave you all off because i really appreciate your time and i know you're probably all wrecked and don't want to be talking for too much longer but the final question i have is a two-parter it is do you think the government so far has done a good job overall and presuming it makes the five years what is the ideal outcome of the said government i'll throw it to rob first then to brian and then finish off with art yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll bring it straight to the program for government. The program for government was was probably the greatest program for government that has ever existed, and I, I do think we, the Greens, we punched above our weight. It's not the ideal scenario where I would like us to be. I know we probably could have gotten more green policies through in partnership with other parties, but it, it is what it is. Ensuring that we get it through and, and follow, particularly our priorities as Greens, which I think are dotted throughout every single section. If we get every single one of them done or close enough to it and, and we know we hold the parties accountable, um, as I'm sure they will be to us, then I think it will have been a, a fairly successful government. There are some very, very good policies here. I'm also hoping that the other parties in government are adaptable uh, and listen to the public uh, as they have on certain issues so far and that we add things to, um, to, to the programme for government and, and get better results. Um, because it's weak, it's very weak in certain areas. It doesn't tackle some issues that I would like it to tackle, but I think that's going to be said by you know the people of Ireland, and it, it's going to be shown uh, at the next polls, um, and maybe that'll be before the end of this government in terms of um, you know any referendums or or local elections even before that. Um, so I'm hopeful, um, but the power of people and, and activism and getting out in the streets when we're not happy about things, that is going to be key here to, to move this government in the right direction on the key issues where I'm a little bit less hopeful. Brian? Yeah, I think considering the circumstances, the government has done a, a pretty good job. Um, there's only so much they can do in terms of housing, like I said, um, for various reasons. And obviously there are some things very big in the way of health and making progress there but you know i'd be very hopeful um you know like Art mentioned earlier on it's it's not about keeping Sinn Féin out like even like i said i, I had different thoughts on going in with Sinn Féin for example but you know a government based on just keeping them out it just isn't good enough it has to be about making things better for people and you know at the end of it regardless of what disagreements we may have we have to improve the fortunes of people in ireland and like housing and he- well obviously look at health is I think everyone will just be glad to get out of COVID. I don't know if they're going to necessarily forget about the other issues, but maybe not concentrate on them as much for whatever reason, But because I just think housing is is the biggest one. And that's going to hit us like a train if we don't get the grips with that. And, you know, the situation, if it's not improved um, over the next four years, if we're in government that long, it'll actually get far worse. So I don't think it's a, it's a case where it'll just remain stagnant and it's just as bad as it was two years ago. I think that will actually be far worse. The population is going to increase. House prices are going to rise. Um, and it's key we talk about. So if we can come out 
of this, regardless of how we look at how each party is going to do. And some people say, oh, I want Sinn Féin to go in so they can make a mess of things so people will see what they're really like. Well, the sacrifice of you know people suffering is just not worth it. So at the end of this, regardless of how many seats we come out with, uh, once we're doing the right thing, we're doing it for the right reasons and we're trying to make things better for people. And um, I think we can look look back on that as a success. And we think we're doing okay so far. Um, you know, relationships have been improving and whether we like it or not, we have to be positive to get our hands dirty and just make, affect some positive change. Mm-hmm. And Art, we'll finish off with you, so. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I think, um, I think what's important really is that we acknowledge that the, the pandemic could be a bit like the, the ending of the Second World War or the Wall Street crash. It could be either the making of us or the breaking of us, depending on how we decide to rethink our economy and society afterwards. The lads are completely right to mention the housing as one of the as one of the core issues that we really, really need to come to terms with over the course of this government and indeed um, the the green and digital transition, uh, both of which I think present huge opportunities for the state and particularly for rural Ireland. Things I would specifically want to see out of the end of this government are um, the public finances being in a healthier state and most importantly, people being back to work. Um, I hope, and I especially include younger people in that as we're looking at some of the highest youth unemployment rates in Europe at the moment. Um, I hope in 2024 or 2025, when we go to the polls, that we can say that the government did a good job in terms of steadying the ship and making sure that people could return to some class of normality that they enjoyed before COVID. And especially looking at things like retail, looking at shop fronts who sacrifice so much and that we make sure that we don't see doors shutting and that never reopen again. I want to see towns and villages right across Ireland vibrant, where we're still a country that can pride itself as being a place where um, you can set up a business or you can create a job or get a job. without that being a victim of COVID along with everything else. But I think the main thing is that we emerge from the pandemic and we save lives. Mm-hmm. Well, Arjun Matney, Brian Mallon, Rob O'Donnell, it's been an absolute pleasure. Hopefully we'll get to speak at some stage again in the future, but uh, I wish you all the very best. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to get in contact with the podcast, you can email us at johnson.business.yt at gmail.com. If you're listening to the podcast on Spotify or other streaming platforms, please drop the podcast a follow. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could subscribe to the channel and share this video. With that being said, I've been Odrin Johnson, and I'll see you in the next video.